It's the Second World War. Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia were at opposite ends, fighting for the Baltic Sea territory. The German U-boat U-479 was operational in the Baltic Sea and is rumoured to have been on a secret mission. Would it be possible to find the lost boat? Hunt for U-479. But it's not only wars that create shipwrecks. Baltic Sea is a hazardous sea, with extreme weather and shallow waters, thousands of islands and rocky shores, and harsh winters when thick ice covers the northern coastlines. The environmental conditions are also unique. The water is cold and the saline levels too low for most marine species to survive, including corals and the shipworm, that everywhere else destroys shipwrecks in no time at all. Baltic Sea is filled with well-preserved wrecks. It's a treasure trove for any diver or archaeologist. The biggest maritime disaster in the world happened in the Baltic Sea. At the end of the Second World War, German ocean liners Gustloff, Steuben and Goya were overspilling with Germans fleeing the Russian occupation. A Russian submarine torpedoed and sunk them. It's such a massive and neglected tragedy that we listened to several stories. Legendary British diver Lee Bishop has dived and photographed Wilhelm Gustloff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of um, a wreck that has uh, got serious political history. Um, you know, huge amount of people died on that wreck, you know. Massive loss of life, and it's a story that you just don't hear about, you know. I mean, she's like a 25,000 ton liner built in the 1930s, built for the strength through joy period. It was like um, uh, a period of time when Hitler was uh, reigning. Mm. There was no first, second and third class passengers. It was all a classless society. You know, you've got to remember, a lot of people didn't buy into the Nazi party, no. you know? Um, so, yeah, and as the Rus Russian Red Army was advancing back in to that part of the world, this was like, you know, 1945, beginning of 1945, end of 1944, and um, basically, um, they were evacuating on anything that was available. Of course, the Gustloff had been, you know, this huge, wonderful ocean liner, um, had been moored up in that, that bay for three or four years and hadn't moved at all. So what they did is they fired it up and there were said to be 7,700 people left on that ship. And it was a ship made for 1,500, 2,000 people at the most, yeah. you know? So heavily over overloaded. So what they did is they, um, you're bearing in mind this is January 1945, it's freezing cold, parts of the Baltic are frozen, and um, it's minus 23 degrees. The, the Gustloff had left the, uh, the harbour then, it was on its way out, and on its way out there was a lot more ships actually um, uh, pulled up alongside, and a lot of nets came down the side, and, and hundreds and thousands of more people climbed up the side. The and some historians say there's, there was a possibility there's 10,000 people on that wreck, on that ship when it sailed, yeah? Now, two and a half hours out of the uh, the bay there, and um, she took uh, a torpedo from the Russian submarine S-13, Marinishkov, but he torpedoed that, and the Goya as well, and um, and at the same time, the General Stoiben was another ship that was carrying a lot of people that had gone down, and so, we're looking at something like 10,000 people on board that ship, yeah? So it was a lot of life on that day. 10,000 people, 400 and something people survived. That was a massive loss of life. Massive loss of life. Maritime's worst ever disaster, mm. you know? Yeah, but you've never heard of it, have you? No, no. No, so many people have not heard this story. I was taking these beautiful wide-angle black and white shots of this wonderfully preserved poop deck with all the stern railing around it, yeah? And we swam round the stern and you could see the letters Wilhelm Gustloff in, in Nazi Still Gothic in lettering. It was unbelievable, you know, you really felt a sense of history down there. And another thing, Roy, we thought we would 
we, we thought we were going to see, you know, lots of human remains, but that, that actually wasn't the case. Uh, but we never really see human remains on many wrecks of even well, no, it's been no, but, life. You know, I th with 10,000 people, you, thought, you would have thought you'd seen some. Up. After the dive, I've come up, and I'm just sitting on the surface, and there's only one other place I felt a presence, uh, and that was on the Titanic, mm. when we was out on Titanic. Yeah. You know, you knew something bad had happened there. In Dover, Yak tells his side of the story. Passenger ships of World War II in Germany were built for economy, not speed. And when the Gustloft sailed, it was decided that being a passenger ship, it should go on its own. Now this was fine, except that it just didn't have the speed to outrun a submarine. The Gustloft then was attacked by a Soviet U-boat and it sank. But the losses were about four times that of the Titanic. Tor, Per and Charlotte have dived General von Steuben several times. If I was talking about, you know, the top five or the top ten wrecks, this is definitely the top one wreck, the best wreck. I've ever, we have ever been mm. diving. One part of it is, of course, this experience of diving this huge, cool wreck. But the other part is like diving to this gravesite where, like, over probably over 4,000 people lost their lives. That was kind of spooky feeling, and it, the, the, <laughs> the boat trip out. It's like it's a 12-hour boat trip from the south part of, of Sweden. It's like in the middle of nowhere. We have no connections on the cell phones, no connection on the VHF. It's like in the middle of nowhere, and you see on the echo sounder the the shape of this huge wreck yeah. on the bottom. It's, it's like it's really creepy, actually. It's really difficult to get an idea of where we are and how and the distances. And soon we did discover that it was actually covered with nets. Um, So the anti-aircraft gun. Yeah. And um, this is, I guess, the shot of the bell. This is the bell. See, yeah. It's, it's enormous. It must be weigh like like a hundred kilo, maybe. Mm. It's like a huge Probably. ship's bell. But it doesn't have any inscriptions on it. Uh, and there you can see a fish actually caught in yeah. one of these nets that you find them everywhere on the wreck. Mm. See, uh, Inside the bridge, yeah, the place where the steering wheel has been yeah, and was from the, the beginning. Yeah. Telegraph, the machine telegraph that signals down to the machine or the engine room how to what speed to go ahead or mm -hmm. like stop or whatever. But that's one thing actually missing on the wreck is the the main steering when someone stole it. If you look closely, you'll see two 
two skulls and... Uh, this, is, this is a strange feeling down here because you get like so amazed by this beautiful ship and all the things you see and out of a sudden you start thinking about my god like 4,000 people dying and you see some remains it's a really spooky spooky feeling and, and it's also some some feelings of like guilt like disturbing this this grape but mm -hmm. it's a really important story to tell so we actually found the hole from the torpedo yeah you got like two two direct hits from torpedoes mm -hmm. and people who have found the other hole uh, or the other place where the, the, the one torpedo hit they say that it's just a like a dent yeah so it probably never went off but we found a place where the torpedo definitely went off because there was a huge hole if what do you say like maybe 20 meters in diameter like twisted metal it was way below the the, the, water, the line. water line The wreck on the bottom today is 100% intact. Mm -hmm. Everything is still there. You can see the mast, you can see like the wires, the lights, the ship's bell, everything is mm -hmm. there. We can't talk too much about Stormen because th that's the wreck actually. It is. It's the best mm. wreck. We met the historian and U-boat author Jacques P. Malmon Shawel at the U-boat archive and he recommended that we visit this museum boat. It's similar to the boat we are looking for, U-479, missing in the Baltic Sea. This U-995 is the world's only remaining Type 7C U-boat. Seeing one for real brings a few surprises. It's so small. When we'll be looking for one at the bottom of the Baltic Sea, it's going to be like looking for a needle in a haystack. It was hot and humid inside. Working and living in one of these things must have been a claustrophobic experience. Horst Bredo is a U-boat archivist and a Second World War German U-boat veteran. He tells about his life on board. So the Baltic Sea was a, the, a very good room for, for training. Uh, uh, operations for the German U-boats. Uh, the, the, this training was very hard. Everybody, from the commander to the last sailor. Um, the sea moves in a most peculiar way and yes. you can't get away from it. Yeah. And he said the first time he was really seasick was when he was on a Type 2 boat. A boat does not go so or so, it does go so. This way, yeah? And I was seasick. I thought I must die. It was always something to work aboard of a U-boat. And when everything was done, then we had Langeweile. What was it? We were bored. <laughs> I had always books with me. I read a lot. I was a young officer, a young watch officer aboard of my boat. And I had to learn a lot of the older comrades. So we had four hours of duty and eight hours and eight hours free, because this crew had 51 uh, crew members. Everybody aboard of a new boat knew exactly what he has to do in every situation.
The Russian submarine Lembit, that claims to have collided with the U-479, was built by Vickers Armstrong in Britain, originally for Estonians. It is approximately the same size and speed as the U-479, and at least in theory, could have hit the German U-boat hard enough to cause serious damage. Kiel Channel is teeming with ships and boats of all sorts. Kiel is famous for its sailing events. However, this is just normal Baltic Sea traffic on a beautiful summer's day. It's a hypnotizing sight. Kiel Channel has been this country's main naval base since 1860s and the center for German shipbuilders. This naval base is still in active use. You can see war memorials by the water's edge. Kiel was known as the war harbour of the Nazi Germany and was heavily bombed by the Allied forces during the Second World War. That round structure is a U-boat pressure chamber where U-boats could be tested for faults and leaks before they were put to real use. To our surprise, U-boats are still built here. And the lost U-boat U-479 was built right here in these docks. Back in our car, we travel to the former East Germany. Traveling from west to east, the landscape doesn't change a lot. It just comes even more rural. We drive all the way to the tip of the Baltic Sea island Usedom to Pinamunde. This is the famous German military and research base where the V1 and V2 rockets were developed by scientist Werner von Braun. You can learn all about the history of the rockets in the especially designated Rocket Museum. The much feared destructive and silently traveling supersonic V2 was the first man-made object launched into space. At the end of the Second World War, Werner von Braun and his expert team were swiftly snatched by Americans to kickstart the NASA space program. Many criticized this decision and saw von Braun as a danger to America because of his Nazi German past. But his defenders thought that he was not a politician, but first of all a scientist. And without him, NASA couldn't have developed its Saturn V rockets and missions to the moon and beyond. One more Baltic submarine museum, recommended by our U-boat expert Yuck. Since the Second World War, East Germany was ruled by the Socialist government. And as a reminder of the Cold War years, there was a Russian submarine museum here in Pienemunde. These Juliet-type subs were made in the 1960s to provide the Soviet Navy with nuclear strike capacity against USA aircraft carriers. They carried nuclear cruise missiles. There were grand plans for these submarines, but only 16 got built in Gorky, Russia. This Juliet U-461 is 90 meters long and sometimes stayed on patrol for more than 90 days three months at a time. With more than 70 men on board, it seems really dark and oppressive inside. We are heading towards the Estonian islands to start the diving trips of the Northern Baltic Sea. Divers, underwater cameras, and diving boat Pelagonia and the Baltic Sea Rex are waiting for us. Swedish divers Tor, Par and Lotta dive Charlotte Schroeder. It lies 70 meters deep in the Baltic Sea. During this dive, the water was crystal clear. What's interesting with the Charlotte Schroeder is that the ship's bell is still there. Mm. Uh, and uh, 
I hope it stays there because uh, most of the time the ship's bell is uh, like a trophy for divers. Yes. The, the first people to discover and dive the wreck usually Takes the take the ship bell. But um, Charles Schroeder has a really nice, beautiful looking bell and it's mm. uh, extraordinary to to do the dive and in the distance you see the bell. And this is this is actually an awesome wreck. This is a like normal size, maybe it's a little bit bigger than Augustus, so maybe like 75 meters long or something. Totally intact except for the bridge. You see this kind of damage uh, on a lot of wrecks in the Baltic. Uh, fishermen uh, fishing with nets or trawl and they get caught. The best information to positions for new wrecks is from the fishermen because they keep track of every place they get caught with the net. Back on the mainland of Estonia, Tanya and Kimo pick up their Finnish colleague, Kari Ketola. We had a drink and a meal on a commuter ferry, but our mood doesn't fit the scene. During the past few months, we've been doing a huge amount of work behind the scenes, organizing the Baltic Sea diving trips. The Swedish diving team will join us later this month, but until then, we are supposed to explore the uncharted Estonian wrecks. At the base camp, our first rental cabin, we start frantically reorganizing everything. The underwater casings for our high definition cameras haven't arrived to Estonia, even though we've ordered them ages ago from the USA. They definitely should be here by now. We can start filming before the camera casings arrive. They should be here in plenty of time during this week. Yes. Oh, that's very well done. So he'll be here uh, five-ish. Then the weather gets lousy and our diving boat will arrive late. It's still in Finland, only a few hours away, but it can't make the crossing in the storm. Is anything going to be ready in time for our diving trips in a few days time? Luckily from the internet, we find Kert Medra from Tallinn, Estonia. He is a diving instructor and knows the Heimar divers. Kert is willing to try to get his local friends to help us. As soon as the weather reports start promising better conditions, we hear that our diving boat Pelagonia is on its way from Finland. Technical fault in the ship had been blamed, but conspiracy theories live on. Nearby there's a touching memorial for the children of the Estonia car ferry disaster. It's small and modest. The bell has a face of a small child on it. It starts ringing when the wind swells up to the strength it did in the night of the accident. On the 28th of September 1994, on its way from Tallinn to Sweden, car ferry Estonia sank in the storm just after midnight. The bad weather and the freezing cold water made the rescue operation very difficult. Only 137 survived and over 850 died in one of the worst modern time maritime disasters. People on board were just everyday tourists and commuters, mostly Swedish and Estonians and a few Finns. The ferry lies only 30 nautical miles northwest from here at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. It's considered a grave site and a no-diving zone. The weather gets better, and when we meet the transit crew in the morning, the mood is already picking up. At the Lethma Harbour, Pelagonia is snugly moored between the cargo ships and the sailboats. We start getting the boat ready for the diving trips and start loading on the camera and the diving gear. 
If only the American underwater camera casings weren't still missing. Keret has asked a Russian Estonian diver and wreck hunter, Andre, to come along. He knows everything about the local wrecks. Um, oh. yeah. Coffee. There's a U boat, U 479. A German U-boat. German, German U-boat. U-boat seven and eight. it was it was outside Uta in in Finland. Okay. And and it was on the waters. It was some kind of mission, whatever. And Lempit came and knocked it. Mm-hmm. And it yeah, 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 no, Russian coming. Estonian diver and wreck hunter Andrei Osipchuk has, has joined our diving crew for a few days. If you want to know about the local wrecks, he is the man to talk to. He has his own side scan sonar and spends all his time diving the local waters. Since Tanya and Kimo don't speak any Russian, Martin does his best to translate. Finnish, Estonian and Russian. All different languages, but we'll manage somehow. The eastern Baltic waters around these Estonian islands are especially interesting. So, meanwhile, we see what the Swedish technical diving team Torp, Per and Lotta get down to on the west side of the Baltic Sea. Via webcam, they tell us about a small cargo shipwreck they found at Swedish Humber. This is Humber. Humber. This is a really small Swedish wreck. It's like 35, maybe mm. 40 meters long. And they were in the middle of the winter in, and the ice was like packing up, so they got actually stuck, stuck in the ice. Yeah. and. They had no radio on board the ship. Mm-hmm. And we found this wreck in 2004, I guess. Mm-hmm. So me and Lola, we were actually the first time. It was very exciting. It was like the visibility was 25 meters. Really and to be like the first person on the wreck, you have no idea where it is. It's, it's really, this, is, this is adventure, it's mm-hmm. really cool. Mm-hmm. Like we would search for any, you know, uh, name, is it a name anywhere? So we found the ship bell, ship's bell. With a name and a date, uh, a year on it. Mm. We we found the name in the in the star. star where it said Humber, and the lifeboats were no longer on the ship, so it's quite obvious that tried to rescue. Yeah, they tried to rescue themselves, but because of the hard weather, the storm weather, and, mm. and it was winter and cold and the pack ice, they didn't survive. Mm. We found the the captain's cabin which is still intact. You can mm-hmm. see the buck, you can see those mattresses with, you know, horse hair, hair sticking, sticking up. Out and you can see lots of, you know, yeah. personal stuff inside there. Yeah. So this is, I like this wreck a lot. This is an easy dive, it's maybe 45 meters deep. That's the coolest part with diving wrecks, is untouched wrecks. Yeah. Is that, it's kind of a cliche, but it's a frozen moment. It is. Everything is in the same place that it was when it sank. So yeah. the time is still, I, even if, you know, if you find a clock, it probably has stopped. At the, time at the time when it, it actually sank. Yeah. So it's uh, it's hard to actually, feeling. that feeling of being yeah. on a wreck. I think we in some of the shots maybe we have got s- some bits of it, but yeah. not fully. You have to yeah. probably experience yourself. The divers Martin, Lenin and Andras are happy to take the plunge. They do ordinary sports diving, much more straightforward than the technical trimix diving our Swedish diving team does. You'll have to watch the boat crew while the divers are diving Unfortunately, there is no chance of getting any underwater footage today. We are still waiting for the underwater camera cases from the USA Diving Gear Company. Hi, this is Kim calling again. They should have arrived already. Every time we talk to them, it gets more awkward. Tracking information. What's the courier? The company can't even give us a tracking number. FedEx. Oh, okay, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Because the coastal regions are so shallow here, the water gets exceptionally warm by August. Something you wouldn't expect from the northern waters. Uh, the water is very, very warm. About 18 degrees. Okay. 
When we start heading back to Hiyuma, the boat engine starts to overheat. We'll have to wait for it to cool down. <laughs> we head back to the Lethma Harbour. It's both a guest and work harbour. Local natural resource timber is often being loaded on cargo ships. They are on their way to the Finnish sawmills. All these young divers work in the forestry industry. It's a big business here. Our Finnish enforcement, diver Tuomas Astron, is waiting for us at the harbour. We have a meal at the beach bar by the Lefma Harbour. A perfect warm evening, good food, great atmosphere. Do you know how to shank a Swedish submarine? No. Send a, send a diver to knock the door. <laughs> <laughs> the jokes of the neighbouring countries and their peoples are forever popular. Tuomas has been doing sports diving for a long time. He also used to work in the diving shop in Helsinki and is well known amongst the Finnish divers. With the help of laughter and general banter, we all get to know each other a bit better while getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. <laughs> this bar is popular amongst surfers and divers. <laughs> we make plans for the next few days. Tomorrow we're planning to uh, visit uh, Andre's boat and visit uh, the museum. Yeah. And again, tomorrow we'll we'll discuss what the program for the next day is because then we'll know. Yeah. Then right. Hopefully, we yes. know tomorrow morning yeah. about the camera housing. Mm. Two major problems: the foxes and the weather. Yes. Yeah. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> see you tomorrow. And thank you. Okay. For see you tomorrow. Yep. Tomorrow. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. And thank you, Tanet. <laughs> The next day, the weather deteriorates. To turn our luck, we visit Ristimäki, Cross Hill in English. There's been a Swedish presence and minority population in Estonia for more than 700 years. Many times they have fled the occupying forces. When the 1,000 Swedes living in Hiumaa packed their boats with their belongings in 1781, they came here to make a cross with the wish that they could one day return to this beautiful island they considered their home. Even here we managed to do business. We cannot wait for the vanished underwater camera boxes any longer and have been able to locate one in Finland. Now we are organising to get it delivered here. It left at seven, so it should be there in nine five minutes. minutes. Five minutes. In about five minutes, yeah, exactly. Every surface of the forest is covered in crosses of all sorts. It's very Blair Witch Project kind of place. <laughs> very deep in the forest. <laughs> Our rainy day continues. We meet the Estonian diving team in Surasadem, one of the oldest harbours in Hiuma. It's now a shipyard, fishing and guest harbour. There's a small maritime museum here. Some of the small treasures that Andre has picked up from the wrecks at the bottom of the sea are on display. <laughs> this place is different from the norm, since there are no do not touch signs anywhere. The old diving gear doesn't seem too comfortable. 
swimming. <laughs> How does it feel? Do you know? Uh, boring, 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 boring. This is boring. This is boring. Fuck off. Suleb Vakta, the chairman of the shipyard, is keen to tell us about the displays. This is the kind of museum we like, with a real interactive feel to it. There's no need for high-tech multimedia display units. Andras tells us the story of an incredibly successful and notorious Hyuma pilot, von Angern Sternberg. Unger. Unger Sternberg, the pilot, started to, to make these bonfires in the wrong place. At the end of the 18th century, Baron Ludwig von Ungern Sternberg was the most feared pirate of the Baltic Sea. With false fires, he lured the passing ships to the cliff edge of the Hiyuma Island. With the help of his men, he killed the crew and collected the cargo. He was smart enough to involve many of the locals and share some of the loot with a large group of people, so nobody was willing to give him up. Tanya and Kimo went to see von Ungern's house, Surimoisa. It's a grand building indeed, huge in scale and style. Although we were here early in the afternoon, the place was locked. The house is used as a primary and technical school, and a former student, Agatha, comes to our rescue and finds a teacher to let us in. Aha! Uh -huh. Yes. That's the picture that is in the... There he is. Baron Ludwig von Ungern Sternberg, a baron, a pirate, and a very wealthy man. The local divers know the spot where the pirate von Ungern sank the ships. They want to explore that area in the near future. Andre's boat is usually moored here, by the big fishing boats. Andre takes off on his own boat. We didn't know at the time but this is the last we would see of Andre. During the whole time, there was a communications problem with him. We didn't share the language, and our documentary filming methods seemed to be entirely alien to him. Too bad. He didn't realize that we were filming him all the time. He's a very mad diver, always alone. Yeah. Tonight it's time to move our base camp, and surprise, surprise, it's all finished. Only a few days ago, it didn't even have any windows or doors. The builders must have worked hard. This holiday home is a traditional Hiyuma farmhouse, now completely renovated for our comfort. A new diver, Lina Ranaste, joins our motley crew. She's Kurt's diver friend from Tallinn. The next day, things start to move on. We get a call from our executive producer. He has sent us his brand new rib to be used as a secondary diving boat. It seems that we are in business at last. Totally dry. This is going smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. The divers Thomas, Martin and Roman go for a quick test dive to try out the camera case. The casing is big and old, meant for a film camera. But this is the best we can get for now. Diver Turmus gets a nickname from the Estonians, Eagle Eyes. You can see why. Now 
Very crazy weather. Very crazy. Uh, cross, cross waves coming from both waves. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Il Capitano. Il Capitano. Il Thank muerto. you for the safe ride. Il Muerto. Il Muerto. <laughs> <laughs> No water. At last, an underwater image. Underwater picture. <laughs> Whoa! Wow! Yeah! It's quite nice. Now that our main Estonian contact Kurt has arrived, it's time to have a proper talk about our Russian captain Andre. He said that we'll do when you arrive. Because he didn't want to start to explain it because he was worried. He had agreed to spend at least a week with us, but just after two days of filming, he has told Kurt he's ready to leave. Maybe when he's not uh, needed that much anymore, he can leave, he will give us all the coordinates. Andre is already bored and frustrated and doesn't understand the whole filmmaking process. Maybe Kurt can explain things to him. I will, I will explain it to him. Yeah. He's a bit different. <laughs> But he's a nice Hello. guy. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Thomas fills the bottles and we are ready to start diving. But surprise, surprise, Captain Andre has had enough and tells Kurt he's not coming back. Maybe we see in the video. Yes, again. Again. It takes exactly two minutes to decide who the next captain will be. This is the new captain. His name shall be Martin or Captain Morgan as we quickly rename our new leader. So let's see how resourceful he is. <laughs> Today, Lady Baltic Sea shows us its most beautiful features. It's such a great day, it hardly seems like work. And and, uh, he can find, find the wreck and then put the anchor down there and uh, then we move this uh, Balergonia a little bit far and also all right, to the Since Andre and his side scan sonar left us unexpected, I think maybe 15 meters more. We have to locate the wreck of the survey boat vest. So where the rubber boat is. Oh, okay. Using the coordinates of the wreck and the rubber rib. You can usually recognize the known wrecks in the boat's underwater sonar. It just tends to be a bit more difficult. The divers do two diving trips to the wreck vest. It was part of the fleet of survey vessels that were bombed and sunk during the Second World War, 23rd of July, 1941. It's not a big ship and lies in shallow waters, in depth of about 16 meters. It's so shallow, you can see lots of surface light in these images, and lots and lots of silt. Since the day happened to be quite windy, all the sediment is on the move. It's like a soup. Thomas is handling the camera and he does well, capturing some of the wreck and the divers. But the visibility is still poor. There's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> we 
wind is high and the sea a bit choppy, but it doesn't matter much. This is what's really astonishing. It takes a big investment, hours of preparations, and hours of travel to do less than one hour of diving. It seems hardly worth it, but all the divers tell us otherwise. It's more than worth it, and when you go down there, it's a world of its own. We have noticed that whenever the diving team is back, they are so happy that they are all smiles. It's called a diver's high. Very early next morning, our plans are confirmed. The weather report warns us of high winds by the afternoon. Pelagonia is clumsy and slow, and we all decide to leave her behind. It would be a lot quicker to just take the rib to the wreck. The crew will be there and back in no time at all. The divers today are Finnish Tumas and Estonians Lena and Martin. Kari will drive the rib, Kimo is filming all this. A friendly local cat is wishing us good luck. Coordinates of the close by wreck are programmed onto the GPS. The divers gear up and go. But then disaster strikes. Even before the divers moor, Kimo knows there's something wrong. The rib is back too soon. The camera case has flooded. It could have been a fault in the old camera case or a human mistake. And if any tiny particle gets in between the rubber seals, the casing would leak under water pressure. Even the half-salty Baltic Sea water can destroy electric equipment in seconds. This high-definition camera is as good as gone. You can see the devastation in everyone's faces. No leaks. Possible to fix, I think. Uh, salt water is quite bad. It's usually corrodes everything. But uh, maybe we must put this camera to the fresh water. Soaking it in fresh water might save the tape. 
It's worth a try anyway. Is this what a diving camera is supposed to look like? Other people build the boat in the bottle, mm. so we have a camera <laughs> in the bottle. You want to buy a camera? Five pounds. <laughs> Five pounds. Very good camera. Underwater camera, as you can see. Thomas is absolutely gutted, but there's no crying over spilt milk. After all, it's just a camera. Thomas is ready to go home, and he'll take the camera casing back to Finland with him. Nobody is accusing him for this mishap, but naturally that doesn't stop Kimo from teasing him. How does he feel now? How does he feel now? <laughs> Can you give us a comment? How does he feel now? He says he's very sorry and will go to the sea now and drown himself. The good old Finnish way. Wise. Walk into the lake. Yes, wise. Yeah. <laughs> and then the boys go for a sauna. It's an old Scandinavian tradition. We still have some time on our hands to see some Baltic seaside sights. Martin, Lena and Dan join us. The motor sailing ship Alar is not much to look at, but it has great symbolic significance for the locals. 144 people tried to escape the occupied Estonia to the neutral Swedish waters at the end of the Second World War on board this old workship. But it was captured. Women and children were released and men sent to prison in Tallinn. Okay. The after-war years of Alla were eventful. This ship has sailed the seas under German, Swedish, English and Panaman flags and only came back to Estonia after 60 years of adventures. It stands as memorial to the colourful seafaring history. This ferry line is the connection between the islands of Hiyama and Salima. Kopu Lighthouse is the symbol of Hiyuma. It's one of the oldest lighthouses in the Baltic Sea and the third oldest still operating lighthouse in the world. 500 years ago, the Hanseatic League was complaining about losing too many ships in the Baltic Sea. They needed landmarks and guiding lights. The construction took a long time to complete since the locals were making a nice extra income looting the sunken ships. The sea mark became a lighthouse only in 1649, when a wooden staircase was built to the outside wall and wood and coal was burned on top of the tower. There's a Soviet-era watchtower to watch the people who came to visit the lighthouse. So this is what's called double surveillance. The lighthouse used so much wood that all the surrounding forests were hacked clean, as far as you can see. And still, when the fires were most needed, in storm and rainy weather, the fire often got extinguished. In later years, this very steep and narrow staircase was tunnelled into the lighthouse, and other light systems, oil, gas and then electricity, have replaced the original wood fires. The latest addition is the concrete skirt, that holds this very old structure upright and is still in use, visible miles and miles to the Baltic Sea. After the sightseeing, we have burgers in this exotic underground bar. Lena tells us that she has made friends for life during the trip to Hiyumar, and Dan turned out to be a good tourist guide. He works for the local museum department and knows about the old buildings. These are the last few pictures you'll see from this day. We ate the burgers, started to drink beer and gin long drinks. <laughs> Ended up listening to old rock and new heavy metal. And we vaguely remember dancing all night in some local restaurant. Luckily, we don't have any pictures to prove any of these stories.